Welcome back to Glam Unfiltered, hosted by me, Josh Smith. And today we're joined by model, activist, former Glamour UK cover star, it's Mumro Bergdahl. <laughs> How are you doing? I feel somewhat vindicated on a personal level, just because what we're speaking about in society at the moment is what I've been speaking about for about three years plus. Um, and people haven't always got it. So to be in a position now where my work, somewhat my life's work is now at the for forefront of the conversation, I feel good in that respect, but also it's a very, very difficult time, obviously, because we're in the midst of a virus pandemic and, um, you know, people are dying and our governments aren't, you know, doing a good job. So it feels a very big paradox somewhat. Some of the things that I've seen happen and you put on social media over the last couple of weeks, days, months, like one of the things that really hit home to me, what you have to deal with every single day is the mm -hmm. amount of hate that you get. Like, I can't imagine what that's like to deal with. It must be so difficult for you. How have you learned how to manage trolls and negative comments? Oh, I mean, it's, it's sometimes really impossible to deal with. It just feels like a tidal wave sometimes. But honestly, I think that the biggest antidote to people hating on you is knowing who you are as a person, because no one can take that away from you. You know, just don't listen to it as much as you can and focus on who you want to be, who you are and honor that rather than, you know, who cares what they have to say about you? I mean, it really is a lot of the time just hurt people wanting to hurt other people mm -hmm. so that they don't need to deal with their own feelings. But if you deal with how you feel and who you are, then it just hurts a little bit less. How have you learned to become at one with yourself in that sense to not let that get to you? What's been some turning points in your kind of discovery of your sense of self? As a trans person, you're kind of forced to. You're mm -hmm. forced to um, find who you are in a world that really doesn't have any space for you. And you're forced to exist within the world that constantly wants to tear you down and invalidate your feelings, invalidate your identity, invalidate your contributions, invalidate your um, possibility of having what we would call a normal life or an authentic life. And trans people have been navigating a hostile environment our, ho our whole lives. So now I feel like it's all coming to a head and we can see racism and facts and figures and stats. So the fact that, you know, black people are 50% more likely to die than um, their white counterparts. You know, we can see um, the problems with police brutality, not only in America, but also over here. So as a person of color, as a black person, as a trans person, as a queer person, and as a woman, I've been navigating a hostile environment my whole life. So I do feel like now that we're all confronted with our phones much more than we were, we're not distracted. I think that we're all starting to see exactly what's wrong with society. Mm. How difficult has it been for you to navigate your sexual identity, your gender identity, and also your racial identity all at the same time? Is it, is, does it make it more difficult in some aspects than others? Uh, yeah, I think until I discovered intersectional feminism, I can't take away my queerness from my blackness, from my transness to um, whatever. It's like, you know, all of our parts of ourselves impact on each other. So until I discovered that, I really didn't connect with feminism. Mm -hmm. I didn't really think it was for me because it wasn't for me because it was mainly focused around the rights of white women and women who could produce babies it was only really until I figured out thought processes and work um, that I'm now suggesting other people to look into um, that I could really you know unpick my own identity and figure out a way to cope within a society that really does invalidate every single part of me on a level feminism really needs to come to the fore right now and also help out trans people and be their allies. How yeah. has that been for you, that allyship from feminism? Have you felt like you haven't received it before and now you're receiving it more? How's that been? 
I think it depends on what feminism you follow. Unfortunately, mm. I think that there's um, a lot of really unhelpful feminism out there, such as the feminism that you know J.K. Rowling um, follows, which is called gender critical feminism, which believes that trans women are men and that the only women are women that um, have a uterus, which is awful because a lot of women can't have children. And does that mean that they're, they're less women because they're no longer of use? Um, and it doesn't center the needs of black women, of sex workers, of the people that really need feminism the most, which is the most oppressed cross sections of society. So I believe that feminism needs to benefit, you know, needs to lift up people that are on the front lines when it comes to sexual violence, which are people that engage in sex work, whether or not that's um, for survival or choice, but also trans women, disabled women, people that are often overlooked within society or have the least rights need the most access to feminism. It's almost like we need to actually redefine what this archaic idea of gender is. I think there's so many people who still prescribe to this binary idea of what gender is as well. Like, you know, like it has to be physical or it has to be internal. Like it can be a mixture of so many different things, what gender means to different people, right? Like what does the idea of gender in that sense mean to you sitting here today? Well, I think that a lot of people conflate sex and gender when they're actually two, they're actually two different things. Mm. I think, well, trans people aren't saying that we were born biologically female. That's not the T, you know, that's not what we're saying. But then also we break down into like, what is female? You know, if we're attaching identity to genitalia, but not acknowledging that if you're born with, say, a vagina, you may not identify with your body. We're just assuming that that baby is going to identify with their body in later life, and we don't know that. So the reality is, is that the body that you're born with may not be the body that you identify later on. Mm. So, I mean, for me, gender identity is as unique as, as we are as individuals. Um, it's all about how you identify. It isn't about your body. It's not about what you were born with at birth. It's not necessarily about chromosomes because sex isn't binary either. Intersex people exist insects kids are being operated on and um you know without their consent without their awareness about what's going on so that's like a very different conversation but that's also linked to like the gender and sex um conversation it's very complicated in very in in many ways but it's also very simple we just mm. need to be allowing people to be who they are what do you think has been the biggest um, a most positive change in the way we talk about trans people and what are the kind of stumbling blocks you're still coming up against? You know, just getting stuck on the same old conversations such as trans women um, being a threat to cisgender women mm -hmm. and not acknowledging the reality of um, the trans experience for women. Um, the reality is that, you know, we're not attacking anybody. I've like one or two trans women have their uh, crimes circulated and be the standard for um, all trans women is really traumatizing for us as a community. Um, and it's really unfair. We, we wouldn't say, you know, because of like school shooters, we wouldn't say that all men are, like have the, you know, are school shooters, it's, it's not fair. It happened with gay men in the 1980s, where gay men were constantly referred to as um, potential paedophiles mm. or um, sexual abusers, and that's that's awful. So in many ways, we're we're navigating the environment that gay men were in the, in the 1980s, um, unfortunately. But our rights are um, increased. But even them, even our rights, you know, are on the table at the moment. How triggering do you find it then? When you see things like, for instance, like the things that have been going on in America with laws and, um, and the rhetoric, like the very fierce rhetoric what's going on, how triggering has that been for you? 
when it comes to existing as a black trans woman walking down the street and constantly being called names and constantly being treated like you're an animal it's you know that's not progressive to me so um i've never experienced the progression that say a cisgender white male um who's gay mm. will experience you know, because the gay rights movement and the rights of gay men, especially white gay men, have been experiencing very much like a vacuum for that community. But a lot of the rest of the LGBT community being left behind. Allyship is such a big term right now that we're all talking about, we're all thinking how we can be better allies to different communities. But I've always thought when you look at the LGBTQ plus community, there needs to be more allyship within it. Like that um, is a serious problem. It's really frustrating because I feel, I really feel like a lot of cis white gay men within the community feel like, well, we've, we've got our rights. Um, mm. we, we, you know, we're, we're good. And it's, it's very much like they've been, they've accessed the power and the, the goal was to access power rather than access liberation for like the whole community. So I want to see, you know, more people that have the privileges within the community pulling each other up. We've all got privilege in one way or another. It's about acknowledging what privilege you've got and applying that to people that don't have it. My privilege is being able to communicate, but also having a big platform that I can amplify other people's voices. So I think it's all about using what you're good at and applying that to other people. Yeah, and I think especially in the LGBTQ plus community, we're not liberated until we're all liberated, right? Exactly. It really is that simple. And I, I wish that there was more compassion across the world anyway. I think as well with allyship, we then come into this other discussion that's happening right now, which is cancel culture. And cancel huh. culture is in so damaging in so many different ways. And I think you said it so powerfully when you um, had that sit down discussion with L'Oreal and you came back and you actually said as an activist, part of my work is to encourage businesses to understand the responsibility. And I think when you came back to them, you had that discussion with them, it was so powerful. Like that is such an amazing thing to do given all the things you've been through as well. How has your relationship with this idea of cancel culture changed and how do you think we can get past the negative aspects of cancel culture? Honestly, it's, uh, it's going to sound harsh, but I really think that cancel culture exists within an echo chamber of ego. Mm. And it can only exist if you are cancelling someone on the basis that you think that you are perfect. And I think it's such a freeing thing to admit that, you know, you may say something stupid on Twitter. It doesn't mean that you're an awful person. It just mm. means that that's something stupid. I think that we need to move from cancel culture to accountability culture. And if someone refuses to take accountability, then that's really when we can talk about, um, you know, not necessarily canceling them because you can't cancel somebody. You can't just send them off to an island and they'll just <laughs> exist over there. You know, you can't stop that. But we're not communicating with each other. We're just cutting each other off and hoping that one party will cease to exist. And sometimes that is necessary with, you know, people being banned from Twitter, but that's not necessarily cancellation. That is, again, accountability. But you are the first trans person to ever appear on a glamour cover globally. What? Yeah. Oh, that's fab. That's such an amazing thing. How much do you think that cover in particular would have spoken to you, the younger you, and how would it have helped you? Well, I didn't really have any trans role models that I could relate to when I was a kid. Um, oh my God, something really exciting happened the other day. Nadia from, I spoke to Nadia from Big Brother. From no, the an icon. No, icon, big icon. So she was like the only trans woman that I saw when I was growing up that um, was just herself and the nation fell in love with her and then unfortunately she was torn apart when she left the house. So it was very much like you could see the duality of public opinion being positive and seeing a trans person for the person that they are and then the media being extremely transphobic mm -hmm. and traditionalist and conservative and not wanting um, a trans person to succeed. But 
apart from that, there wasn't any trans representation. There was like, you know, trans people getting heckled on Jerry Springer, on Maori, on Ricky Lake and being called freaks. And then there was Haley from Coronation Street. God bless her. She was lovely, but she wasn't played by a trans character. Yeah. She was like 30 something um, year old woman. And I was like, again, a 16 year old child. So I'm just in many ways trying to be the representation that I wish I had seen when I was a kid and trying not to, you know, ever put myself in a position of perfection or trying to make people fit, see me as, you know, I'm not trying to assimilate into a culture. I'm trying to bring trans culture and bring black culture and bring queer culture in an authentic way to people that haven't seen it before. Mm. I'm not trying to fit in. I'm trying to be myself. This is one of the most powerful uh, changing times we've yeah. ever had. For you personally, what is the one lesson or positive you want to take away from 2020? I think it's, you know, um, always try and find the positive in um, difficult situations and bear in mind that things may not go your way, mm. but it's about figuring out how to navigate that situation and something better will grow out of it. We've seen spikes of interest in BLM and trans rights in the public sphere before and we've seen it ebb, we've seen it flow, it's gone up, it's gone down. Do you feel like the momentum is going to keep up now? I think you can just feel it. You can feel that this is different. The protests haven't stopped. They're not slowing down. Um, the accountability um, and the organization and mobilization um, of our generation and the generations below. What would you like to see in the workplace to make it more inclusive and welcoming? Um, I think it really comes down to minorities in decision-making roles. Yeah. And, um, not just, you know, minorities being hired in say the intern position or the lower level position. I want to see black people doing the hiring. I want to see black people making the decisions. I want to see all kinds of people in the room making the decisions and calling the shots. You create a better product that is appealing to all people if all people are in the room to create the product in the first place. So I think if we're looking to create sustainable diversity and inclusion, then it has to be at every level. It has to be authentic and it has to be progressive and constantly evolving so that every single issue is covered. Um, it's been so amazing listening to you, talking to you. I mean, I, spoke to you, I can speak to you all day, so. <laughs> <laughs>